Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure to address you today on behalf of the National Unity Government. I thank the University of Tokyo for inviting me and I acknowledge the esteemed speakers in attendance. The focus of this event is the marking of two years since the illegal military hunter failed in its attempt to seize power. Actually, what we must truly mark is two years of sustained revolution against an inspiring tyrant and unprecedented nationwide refusal by the Myanmar people to surrender their freedom and democracy to tax with, with guns. The National Unity Government represents the continuity of democracy in Myanmar. We draw legitimacy from the 2020 general election which was independently determined to have been free and fair. We enjoyed the express support of our people. We are inclusive of all sectors of society and continue to lead from inside the country. And with our ethnic partners, we exercise significant and growing territorial control and provide essential public services and humanitarian assistance. Notably, there has been a recurrent call by the international community in recent months. It was made in the historic Security Council resolution on Myanmar adopted last December. It was a call by the UN General Assembly. And last week, the UN's special envoys on Myanmar made it it's one of her tough stones. This call is that the future of Myanmar must be determined in accordance with the will and the interests of the people. That in a sig significant sentence is the mandate of the national unity government to serve consistent with the will and in the interests of our people. Now compare this to the hunter. On 6 March, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights addressed the Human Rights Council, the UN's premier Human Rights Forum and told the world that the Honduras disregard and contempt for human life and human rights constitutes an outrage to the conscience of humanity. In UN terms, it is hard to think of a stronger condemnation. This rightly captures the skill and barbarity of the deliberate widespread and systematic atrocities that the Honduras continue to allege on our civilian population. The Myanmar people are showing remarkable unity and resolve in their refusal to submit to tyranny. But our resistance comes with appalling cause. The Honda had murdered more than 3,140 civilian children, women, and men. Some it shot dead during peaceful protests. Others, it targeted with jets, bombarded with artillery, or burned to death. Let me repeat that. It is using jets and artillery to attack villages. These are clear and undeniable acts of war. What is more, its aerial attacks have compromised the airspace of Myanmar's neighbors, threatening the peace and security of our region. Consequently, 1.3 million people have been driven from their homes, many pushed into neighboring countries. This new homeless has been added to the hundreds of thousands of Myanmar nationals, particularly the Rohingya, already forcibly displaced by an earlier waves of military atrocities. Last July, the Honduras hanged four pro-democracy activists, including former parliamentarian. Its use extrajudicial executions implemented and our effects of legal process reveal the skill of its contempt for the rule of law and international norms. Despite exhaustive international demands for their release, more than 16,500 civilian language in arbitrarily detained, many of them youth exposed to torture and sexual violence. And the Honduras continues to use Stavations and to block people's access to medicine and vaccines as tactics of war. The High Commissioner for Human Rights was right. 
these crimes are an outrage to the conscience of humanity. And yet, the international community continues to waver. Some countries are playing strategic hate, others are extending moral, but not material support to us. ASEAN and the UN are passing the pattern of responsibility back and forth. Yet, the choice between the Myanmar people and the Hauntal could not be stucker. Freedom or terror, stability or crisis, democracy or dictatorship. I will close my remarks with some requests that I hope will inform today's discussions. First, a broad coalition of states must formally recognize the national unity government as the legitimate representative of Myanmar and its people. This will open increased political, humanitarian, economic, and material support to us. And it will undercut the Honduras goal of holding sham elections. Today's speakers are well placed to advance this discussion on this, as they come from a number of crucially important countries, Japan, India, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, and the United States. Second, we need a humanitarian assistance mechanism that truly prioritizes the neutral and impartial delivery of aid to all communities in need. The writing assistant through the Hontal will not only see aid manipulate for military advantage, it exposes implementing partners, including UN agency, to complicity in Honduras crimes. Third, we must push ASEANs in support. Indonesia must be supported and empowered as ASEAN chair, including through sustained attention on Myanmar by the UN Security Council. We are already in March, and the window for action in this critical year is narrowing. Furthermore, the five-point consensus must be expanded to set out clear consequences for the Honduras, continuing failure to meet its commitments and its disdain for ASEAN. Fourth, we must take the balance in favor of freedom, staff the Honduras of its capacity to wage war on civilians, impose sharpened measure that cut its access to um, munitions, catch, dual use items, and jet fuels. And finally, we need help to end impunity. Shameful past failures of our nation permitted horrendous atrocity to be committed against minority communities, including the Rohingya. This impunity that followed enabled the hunter to take its crimes countrywide. We need support for our efforts at the International Criminal Court and at the International Court of Justice to deliver justice to victims and their families. And we need countries with universal jurisdiction to use their national courts to hold perpetrators to account. The ICC has just issued an arrest warrant for Vladimir Putin. Why not for me online too? Particularly given that the national unity government has accepted the ICC's jurisdiction were in uh, Article 12.3 declaration. Ladies and gentlemen, the people of Myanmar will not rest until they prevail. And the national unity government and its partners owed their people peace, freedom, justice, equality, opportunities, and economic security. Their democratic world demands it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to um, Foreign Minister um, Zimmer Ong for um, those remarks. Um, I'd now like to um, hand the um, session over to um, Deputy Foreign Minister uh, Moza O oh to provide um, additional remarks. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, especially uh, for the University of Tokyo for organizing this uh, brilliant webinar two years after the military coup, regional perspectives on human security. We are past the two year anniversary of the attempted military coup on 1st February this year, but the darkest days are still facing us ahead. As you know, unlike the previous ones, this time the attempted coup faced 
the countrywide peaceful demonstrations participated by all generations, including the civil servants and civil disobedience movement. But the military conducted a brutal crackdown using excessive and unbelievable violence with lethal weapon and atrocities. As a result, the health system collapsed, combined by the weaponization of COVID-19, especially during the third wave. Denial of humanitarian access offered by the international NGOs and UN organizations drove the country into the humanitarian crisis. The economic cont contracted, the currency chart devalued, the price of commodities went up. Uh, the country lost nearly one third of its electricity generation capacity since the attempted coup. The banks remain on the edge of collapse. The illicit economy is appearing uh, with the look of Yangon as back to normal. The drug producing is thriving. Land grabs are starting again. Even in the cities, the military evict the urban poor from their homes. People have been displaced from their home since the attempted coup. Rohingya population, about 1 million, are still in Bangladesh taking shelter, uh, who have no chance of return home in the near future. Many foreign businesses with major investments in Myanmar have left, and the Financial Action Task Force blacklisted Myanmar, highlighting the risks that the military poses to global efforts against money laundering and terroristic financing. Over the past 20 months, Myanmar has become an origin of several new forms of human trafficking and criminality, which increasingly represent a clear and present threat to global security and human rights. For the first time in Myanmar's history, the country has become a target destination for human trafficking, with nationals from around the globe now being held in against their will in these zones, as many more face the threat of being trafficked or scammed. After the attempted coup, the people stood up against a military dictator. The spring revolution started with nationwide demonstrations and civil disobedience movement as well as point out against the military products and services. Then the committee representing Pidang Zuklato, CRPH, formed with parliamentarians. Then the national unity government was also established, a platform called National Unity Consultative Council was formed with different stakeholders and declared the Federal Democracy Charter and abolished the 2008 constitution. The national unity government functions in multiple fronts through various ministries. For example, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has successfully reached out to the governments, the parliaments, United Nations organizations, international organizations, regional blocs like the EU or the ASEAN. The Ministry of Planning, Finance and Investment is mainly responsible for raising funds for our revolution through different programs. Uh, we also set up a digital monetary system called NUGP to counter it on the blockage by the military hunter for banking and digital transactions. The Ministry of Health and Education has set up urgent care centers, hospitals run by the city and health care providers in liberated areas and support the medical equipment with available fundings. Ministry of Education opens community schools run by CDM teachers in some areas. It also offers the Federal Head Online Learning Program. The Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs and Disaster Management provides the distribution of humanitarian assistance for internally displaced people in conflict areas, uh, for prisoners, families of fallen heroes, disaster afflicted people acquiring the humanitarian assistance in coordination with ethnic organizations, CSOs, CBOs, NGOs, INGOs, and 
some UN organizations. The Ministry of Human Rights keeps track on the human rights violation, criminal cases, and conduct documentations of crimes against humanity and war crimes committed by the military forces across the country in order to be used to bring the haunter to justice using international judicial mechanisms. Uh, there are other ministries such as Ministry of Home Affairs, Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Women, Youth and Children, Ministry of Federal Union Affairs, Ministry of Labor, and so on. In May 2021, the NUG decided to establish the People's Defense Forces under the Ministry of Defense to organize uh, the defense forces systematically across the country that have already born naturally due to the brutal crackdown of the military forces on demonstrators. With the responsibility to protect the life and property of the people, we aim that our PDFs will be the precursors of the future Federal Army, a professional armed forces. The PDFs have become a formidable defense force on ground against much better equipped military forces so that the military uses now airstrikes very dominantly. Uh, the military has escalated the military offenses and other armed actions against all those who resist them. This has included violent and discriminate and terroristic attacks on civilians. In particular, they have increased the use of area strikes, including discriminate attacks on civilian targets, religious structures, even on hospitals and schools. Another attempt of the military is to hold sham elections. That fraudulent act should not even be called as election. First of all, the military neither has the authority nor the legitimacy to conduct elections. It is just their attempt to hold on to power by manipulating the possible results of such so-called elections. The recently announced so-called party registration law is a good example. They excluded virtually all other political parties, even including the National League for Democracy that won previous elections, except for their own proxy political parties. And all the groups that genuinely represent the people did not accept the new elections and already indicated that they will make attempts to counter all electoral process using all possible peaceful means. But the military admitted that they could control only 198 townships out of 330 townships, exactly 60% of the country's territory, and had to extend their so-called state of emergency to announce uh, uh, another six months time. Their planned elections plot has also been postponed uh, because of the lack of guarantee for the security and lack of ground control on about the half of the country. We, the national unity government has been trying to permanently eliminate the military's political dominance in rebuilding our new federal democratic union uh, with equal rights for all ethnic groups of the country. Uh, the people in general, especially the young generation of our country is quite determined to continue the spring revolution and this such a federal union has been established. I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Bonsao. Um, Alawina, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, greetings from Jakarta, Indonesia. Uh, good afternoon. Ming Larba, Konnichiwa. Um, thank you very much for inviting me, for having me to speak at this uh, webinar, Excellencies, Distinguished Panelists, Ladies and Gentlemen. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, ASEAN's approach, uh, being an ASEANer and also being an Indonesian. Uh, how is it failing? What can be expected this year under Indonesia chairship? And what can and what uh, should be done? So I'm going to divide my talk in three segments. First, the first segment, what is the ASEAN approach and how is it failing? So the ASEAN approach is uh, known as the ASEAN five point consensus. 
And as a reminder to everyone, uh, the five-point consensus uh, was issued by the nine ASEAN leaders following their meeting with the senior general Min Aung Lang in April 2021, three months after the coup. The five-point uh, consensus uh, calls for an immediate cessation of violence, constructive dialogue among all parties, mediation of the dialogue process by the ASEAN Chair Special Envoy, provision of humanitarian assistance, and a visit of the ASEAN Chair's Special Envoy to Myanmar to meet uh, with all parties concerned. Now, largely, none of these are happening, or only very little seen so far. The ASEAN leaders themselves in November last year during the ASEAN summit said that there is little progress. And that is largely due to the non-compliance of the junta's commitment on the implementation of the ASEAN five point consensus. That's what they said. The SAC for sure has definitely blatantly ignored the ASEAN five point consensus. And one clear example was the execution of political prisoners last year, not long after Prime Minister Samdek Hun Sen of Cambodia, the most senior leader of ASEAN and chair of ASEAN last year, made an appeal to the SAC. It was definitely a mockery for the ASEAN five point consensus, as well as ASEAN as an institution. In fairness, to ASEAN though, the ASEAN five point consensus was the only thing on the table until the UN Security Council adopted its first resolution on Myanmar last December after more than 70 years. But is it failing? I believe so, definitely. And everyone else is too because there has not been any improvement on the situation on the ground. So what can be expected? What are the opportunities and what are the challenges this year? It's difficult actually to establish an outlook for the coming months. I used to be an optimist, realistic, but I have now shifted to become just a realist. What I expect on what I expect from Indonesia's chair, chairmanship. And these are for simple reasons. But first, let's look at the five point consensus. As the one who hosted the leaders meeting with the senior general in April, 2021, and the one who brokered the ASEAN five point consensus in Jakarta, Indonesia, Indonesia, as chair this year, will continue to stick to the ASEAN five point consensus in its entirety, regardless of the massive criticism to drop the five point consensus and replace it with a new plan. So as a face saving, the five point consensus perhaps should not be replaced, but it can be repurposed. And that is an opportunity. We now have the ASEAN leaders review document, which contains 15 points of decision and review on the implementation of the five point consensus last November. And, and therefore can be considered as a supplementary document to the ASEAN five point consensus. If you have studied the 15 points, it does offer some new approaches and offering some flexibility and creativity, but only if ASEAN wants to push the button and push themselves to the limits. Another opportunity is the development of the implementation plan with concrete roadmap, practical and measurable indicators and timeline. And the implementation plan, because it was tasked last November, should already be developed under the chairmanship of Indonesia this year. So while we can repurpose it, the five-point consensus, the runway 
for Indonesia is very short. Three months already now, as mentioned by the foreign minister of the NUG. And within this year, there will be two ASEAN summits, the one in May and the second one in September, which is quite soon for a second summit. So we only practically have six months left. I'll count it, six months. So I would suggest, and I'm happy that the Deputy Foreign Minister is here with us. I would suggest for the Myanmar's uh, pro-democracy movement, if one of you ever consulted by the Office of the Special Envoy, please make a strong call and request the Indonesian government to involve you in the development of the implementation plan. Because that's the opportunity to repurpose the five point consensus in the interests of the people of Myanmar. Now, the third point on what can be expected being me as a realist. Well, we know that the envoy ship <clears throat> rotates with the chairship, which is annually. But it's quite interesting that uh, the foreign minister of Indonesia established the so-called Office of the ASEAN Special Envoy, not Office of the ASEAN Chair, huh? but Office of the ASEAN Special Envoy. So this could be seen as an effort to ensure continuity, which is good. So after Indonesia's chairmanship ends, the office can continue helping the next envoy so only the head changes. Not too good though. Well, as of now, the, we, know, we know that the office has been talking to different stakeholders informally and quietly to prep for the so-called inclusive national dialogue. Though it is not clear to me because everything has been very quiet. Quiet diplomacy, however, can also lead to different interpretation and speculations. And we all know that there is no clear finish line in a protracted crisis. It's a marathon, not a sprint. So there cannot only be one dialogue as mentioned in the five point consensus. So what should be done? Are there some more opportunities and challenges? And this is my suggestion. You may not like it if you are within the system. I am outside the system, so I can say whatever they want. But being an ASEANer and being an Indonesian, I would suggest, and being a disaster manager myself, and crisis manager, I'll, I'll suggest that ASEAN should go to the basic. What happened two years ago on the 1st of February, 2021 was not only illegitimate and illegal, but also unconstitutional by the definition of the ASEAN chapter. And this was confirmed by prominent individuals who were involved in the drafting of the ASEAN chapter, which is ASEAN's constituent instrument. So ASEAN, who is supposed to be constitutional, should go to the basic by clearly defining who is the legitimate, who is the legal, and who is constitutional government, and take a much harder political stance against the unconstitutional move by the current regime. It's basic for the next step for everything else. In fact, sorry to say, it's a crisis management 101. It's so-called causal analysis. The problem and the root causes of the crisis must be recognized first and assessed correctly for the right decision and the right action to be made. It should have been done two years ago, but not too late. And if the nine ASEAN leaders have not been able to do so, then they should do it quickly this year under the chairmanship of Indonesia. Now, <clears throat> second, stop holding their hands. 
And this is a call for ASEAN again, for the SAC itself, which is only a military outfit of an ethnic majority group called the Bama. They have experienced major setbacks in their international diplomacy with ASEAN because they have been prevented from attending ASEAN Leaders Summit and ASEAN Foreign Ministers Meeting. And their rep representation at other ASEAN meetings could be subject to a review by the foreign ministers mentioned in the leaders document last November. So it is unprecedented. It's a win for the pro-democracy movement. It's a form of soft sanction by ASEAN, which should continue and apply it to all ASEAN meetings. It just doesn't make sense. Those who are under the direction of the major source of violence, the one committing crimes against humanity, war crimes, genocide, ethnic cleansing, killing the children and the women, continue to take part in the ASEAN community building process. As ASEANers, we all should actually not let that happen. The negotiation and diplomacy can take place separately. They can have a separate uh, ASEAN meeting only on Myanmar. Exercise multiple tracks, exercise bilateral tracks, but don't give the SAC representation and those under the current regime structure the privilege to have a seat and the right to participate in regular meetings of ASEAN and make decision about the future of ASEAN. Don't let them participate in any of the ASEAN exercises, tabletop exercises, simulation exercises, training whatsoever, as if the situation were normal. And it should also be applied to ASEAN dialogue partners, including US, including EU, including Norway, Japan, Australia, UK, and many others. Please streamline the policy of non-participation of the military junta across all regional meetings and activities where you are involved as a co-chair, co-host, delegation, or a funding partner. Last point from me, we can expect that the ASEAN approach will continue to be done on an ad hoc basis through two summits every year and short runway every year. As mentioned by Bilahari from Singapore, do not expect ASEAN to run. It's a cow, not a horse. And cow cannot run fast. ASEAN does have a design problem in its decision-making process. Our inability to resolve the ongoing Myanmar crisis has further exposed our inherent flaws. However, while moving slowly like a cow, it doesn't mean that we cannot do something. ASEAN internally can at least undertake a real-time evaluation, fact-based learning on how decisions are made in conflict-induced crisis situation to inform the much-needed revision of the ASEAN Charter. So I'll stop at that and I'll entertain the questions later on. Thank you again. So much, um, Adelina. It's a very strong and, and excellent um, um, outlining um, kind of ASEAN and Indonesia's um, perspective on the, the crisis. Uh, next, I want to turn over um, the, the floor to um, former Foreign Minister um, Kasip Kromia. Um, Kung Kasip, uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Good afternoon from Bangkok to everyone, and thank you for the invitation. I have been interested to say something about the current policy direction of the of the of the Thai government. And I have to say that I have been very disappointed indeed for the past two years with the performance of my government under General Prayut Chan Ocha. For the very fact that the this government has been more familiar and friendly towards the military junta in Myanmar rather than to the aspiration and the plight and the democratic inspiration of the Myanmar people. 
And second, Thailand, I think since the end of the Second World War, has been all along a country of refuge for refugees forthcoming from the French return to Indochina, the American occupation and the Vietnamese occupation of the Cambodian, the Vietnamese boat people, and successive waves of uh, uh, Burmese refugees throughout the past uh, six, six decades. This is the first time ever that we have a Thai government that has been ignoring the very noble undertaking by the Thai government of opening up all the borders for incoming refugees, asylum seekers, and opening the Thai borders for various types of humanitarian assistance. So in that sense, I am very critical of this particular government of Thailand for being so callous, ignoring, I think, the hardship of our fellow human beings who are also members of the ASEAN community. And Thailand has the tradition of opening up the borders and Thailand has the right and obligation to do so for the fact that Thailand has a common border with Myanmar, a length of more than 2,400 kilometers. And in that sense, Thailand, the Thai government must open the border first to welcome all the refugees and political asylum seeker. Second, to open border for all humanitarian assistance to go to the Myanmar people along the Thai-Myanmar border and deep inside into Myanmar for the Myanmar people as a whole and so on. And at the same time, I think I would also like to call on all the, I think, partners of ASEAN, dialogue partners, uh, donor countries and so on to pressure the Thai government to open the border and to work very closely with all the UN agencies you know, this is an imperative thing that we have to do it now. I think the I think the hardship of the people should come on the forefront. Second is on the political side. Unless and until Thailand works very closely with other founder members of ASEAN, namely Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, and the Philippines, then ASEAN would not be in the position to move the five point consensus or to overcome, I think the military takeover of the Myanmar country. So there must be closer relationship, working relationship between Indonesia and Thailand in particular, and with Malaysia and Singapore and the Philippines to come into the picture and to push, I think the junta back to their barracks and to help the Myanmar people to get back their democracy. So it very much depends on the will, the vision and the willingness of the Thai government. As of yesterday, the Thai parliament was declared closed. We will have a new elections, I think on the 14th of May. So nothing much could be done for the time being unless that we have a new government by the month of June and July and so on. But among all the, I think, uh, ASEAN uh, tradition type, uh, the traditional practice and so on, we don't have to be that formal. We can continue the conversation. And now with the ASEAN chairmanship under the, I think, uh, command of Indonesia. Indonesia is the most democratic, the biggest member, the founding member of, of Indonesia, of uh, ASEAN. We would like to see more proactive leadership forthcoming from the Indonesian presidency and the foreign minister and so on, and to have a sort of a shuttle diplomacy with Bangkok in order to work together and to push ASEAN five-point consensus and ASEAN joint position and so on, and take all of this up with the military junta, as well as to have a formal dialogue with the NUG, CRPH, and so on. This is something that I think Indonesia and Thailand could do together. And with we do need the leadership of Indonesia. It is a democratic country. It is a founding member. It is the largest member of, uh, of, of, of ASEAN. And without Indonesia taking, I think the uh, sort of a proactive position, nothing would move. And the Thai government would listen very tentatively 
whether it is an interim government or caretaker government and so on to whatever Indonesia would like to do and to take the leadership. And if Indonesia and Thailand do join forces, the rest of the ASEAN member state would come uh, together and we as the nine can surely put senior General Mong in light uh, into his place and to tell him that there is no future for Myanmar under military dictatorship. I think the whole world is moving towards an open society with people as the, I think, center of everything. And that is the ASEAN wish and ASEAN ideology. You cannot have the people-centered principle unless and until the people are really at the center and not the military junta or any form of authoritarian regime. One other point, I am deeply disappointed with the Japanese government for the fact that Japan has been very active on the Ukraine-Russia theater. But what about Myanmar and ASEAN? Just at the back of Japan, I think Japan has been a heavy, the biggest investor, biggest donor country, has every stake in the development of Myanmar, Thailand, and the whole of ASEAN. Where is Japan at this point in time? Can they not pay a bit of attention to the situation in Myanmar and work with the ASEAN on the five-point consensus? And Japan could also work with Australia and the United States and the EU to find a common cause to work together both the United Nations and in various capitals of ASEAN in order to push the military back into the barracks. At least Japan could work with a meeting between all the stakeholders of the Myanmar theater. Japan could do this. And I would wish that after this conference organized by the Tokyo University, Japan will take a more proactive and leading role and do not put Myanmar at the back of this seat and so on, because you have been very much on the forefront on the Ukraine side, but Myanmar and ASEAN things are things at home here, and Japan cannot avoid taking a more responsibility and a more proactive role. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, um, to give us um, additional context on um, ASEAN, next uh, we have uh, Thomas Daniel. Uh, from Malaysia. Thomas, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Sam. I hope you can hear me. Um, I've got 10 minutes. I'll, I'll try and stick within my time. But if I do uh, cross over, please just let me know and I'll stop my remarks. Uh, before I get into my points, perhaps just a very uh, quick response. You know, it's, it's hard to follow uh, the Deputy Foreign Minister, to follow Adelina and to follow uh, Punta Tid, but I'll give it a go. Just a couple of quick responses here. Um, I think from where I stand in Malaysia, it's it's impossible to see, uh, you know, it's impossible to see ASEAN traction on Myanmar without the deep support and buy-in of Bangkok on this. Um, but I do, uh, I, but I would like to also flag that when Brunei decided as chair to basically disinvite uh, Myanmar political leaders from attending uh, the ASEAN Leaders Summit and the ASEAN Foreign Ministers meeting. Um, that was not a unanimous decision. Thailand did not, in fact, uh, agree to that decision. And I still hear from, uh, from diplomats in Bangkok uh, that there is some degree of soreness uh, that while Thailand did not oppose, uh, there was no way in that they considered that they agree. So, uh, but, but this, this also represents, uh, you know, to me, uh, another opportunity that ASEAN can, in fact, make decisions without uh, resorting to a consensus because there was no consensus for this, for this decision. Uh, second point is that um, my understanding right now, and maybe I can get Unkasi to comment on this later, is that Bangkok is now considering an approach that focuses mainly on uh, Myanmar's neighbors. So uh, Bangladesh, India, China, uh, in, 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 in particular, and in Thailand, uh, to, uh, to, to sort of try and find alternative ways uh, beyond, the, beyond the ASEAN uh, ambit approach. Now, whether this is an additional track or whether this represents uh, this, uh, this, a line of thinking by folks in Bangkok that perhaps uh, that, that they do not want to proceed with ASEAN on this uh, is, is something that we can discuss later. 
Um, to Dr. Adelina, uh, the uh, the argument of um, the argument that Myanmar has broken the ASEAN Charter is a very interesting one. Uh, I've seen arguments that point out that uh, Myanmar has in fact violated various principles stated in ASEAN two in in in, in Article two uh, point two of the ASEAN Charter, and that uh, Article point four of Article twenty actually. Uh, prescribes that if there is a serious breach of principles of the charter, then the matter is referred to the ASEAN summit for a decision. But as we can tell, the ASEAN summit has come to no decision yet uh, after several meetings. Uh, and I guess the challenge here is that there is no real prescription on what action the ASEAN summit can take. And we you know, clearly have a very disunited summit. Uh, with that, let me very quickly launch into my points. Uh, my, 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 my three points in general, uh, number one, about uh, why Malaysia has for the large part adopted uh, an approach that the five point consensus is no longer workable. Uh, I will then very quickly speak about why Malaysia is particularly concerned and, and outspoken on Myanmar, and then my thoughts on how ASEAN can move forward. Uh, so very quickly, uh, it's been a year and 11 months, about almost two years since the five point consensus was presented to me online in Jakarta, uh, and on all points, uh, that, that there's been very little progress at all, right? Violence has not ended. It's gotten worse. Uh, extended uh, offers of ceasefires with various ethnic armed organizations have failed. Uh, fighting rages across many provinces. Uh, the number of displays, as mentioned earlier, has already breached uh, more than a million, and that was in June last year. Uh, and violence has, in turn, then, you know, violence, the lack of a political option, uh, the, the lack of any avenue to, to express uh, opposition or peaceful opposition to this coup has inevitably led to the, to the fact that a lot, of, uh, a lot of Burmese have now given up and, the, and have decided that the only uh, kind of response that the Tatmadaw will understand is violence of their own. Of the People's Defense Forces, whose armed resistance operations has been endorsed by the NUG. Uh, the SAC has extended martial law across 37 townships, last month um, and uh, you know, so the country is basically in a state of de facto fizzle, uh, civil conflict. I know colleagues who would use the term civil war more openly. Uh, there is again, zero sign of visible dialogue. Uh, uh, the general tone from the Tamado is as defiant as ever with little interest shown in reconciliation. And while humanitarian assistance from ASEAN has been able to get in, it is largely coordinated through the ASEAN Coordinating Center. Uh, and that process itself has been sub subjected to a lot of criticism as being too dependent on the SAC, uh, which means that aid is in fact weaponized by the military, by the military government, and large amounts of people do not receive any help whatsoever. And that calls. Uh, by multiple uh, former foreign ministers in Southeast Asia, uh, notably in Malaysia and Thailand, uh, for ASEAN to reconsider how aid is being distributed and to consider working with credible local NGOs and community organizations. Uh, the multiple visits of ASEAN special envoys to Myanmar has not yielded any single, uh, any single sign of progress. Uh, Hun Sen's visit failed to convince uh, Myanmar or Ming online. And, and you know, interventions and appeals by ASEAN leaders and member states are ignored point blank. Or worse, uh, the junta actually escalates. And you know, don't forget that in July last year, despite statements, official statements by many uh, ASEAN member states, uh, you know, Nepidaw went ahead and executed four, four pro-democracy activists, including a former MP. Uh, in, in, you know, depressingly, uh, the one area where uh, there has been progress on the five point consensus is the appointment of special envoys. So we've had two special envoys, three if Indonesia goes down that route, but then again, in a very predictable ASEAN fashion, uh, very little results elsewhere. Uh, we've seen calls for the five point consensus to be amended or refined, but I would caution here that any refinement or amendment does not necessarily guarantee a more favorable outcome to the people of Myanmar. Uh, what could likely happen is, you know, refinements would put could ineffectively you know, dilute the five-point consensus and allow more regional breathing space for the junta. And ASEAN's acquiescence here will only embolden the Tatmada for even greater leverage in the future, uh, which I think is a huge mistake if ASEAN were to be, to be sucked into this course of action. Uh, 
Uh, now, why is Malaysia particularly concerned outspoken? Here, I will just offer two reasons. The first is that you know we are concerned in KL, in, in Kuala Lumpur, there is concern that the crisis in Myanmar you know, will spill over, not just to regional countries, which it already has, but impact um, ASEAN's, fo uh, ASEAN's focus and possibly how external partners view ASEAN and possible avenues of cooperation if Myanmar was represented by the Fatma Daw. Uh, the second reason is that the conflict in Myanmar has repercussions on the large numbers of refugees and asylum seekers hosted by Malaysia and the numbers that it will likely have to accommodate in the future, specifically meaning uh, you know, uh, the Rohingya who are mostly based in Bangladesh. Now, government policies have been increasingly regressive and punitive in Malaysia against these groups and there's growing xenophobia. So the government feels that, that there needs to be some kind of a political settlement in Myanmar to ease problems in Malaysia. Uh, my last point, and I know I'm almost out of time here, is how can ASEAN move forward? Um, you know, given the intricate complexities of this regional organization, we, it has naturally struggled to find a unified position in Myanmar or to persuade the Tanmado to adhere to the five-point consensus. Uh, but, you know, and, 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 and given that there is disunity among the member states on how to proceed or even if it should proceed, uh, it's likely not going to make much process. However, let me also add this, um, and it's a quote by Charles Santiago, a former Malaysian member of parliament and the former chair of the ASEAN Parliamentary, uh, Parliamentarians of Human Rights, who said last year that reliance on ASEAN is not, a, not just a strategy, but it is a disingenuous deflection of responsibility by international actors. So I cannot help but agree with this. It is a wicked problem and it is, there are no easy or quick solutions in sight, but for the international community to throw the task of tackling this to ASEAN, an organization that knows full well that they are incapable, uh, flawed, and also restricted by what they can do is rather disingenuous. Now, there have been calls for ASEAN to uh, work with dialogue partners that actually have influence on, this, on the SAC. Uh, India, China, Japan, and ROK comes to mind. As Kun Kasit said, uh, you know, these are countries that which the SAC is more dependent on now more than ever. Um, there's also an argument for ASEAN to consider a permanent special representative uh, or a permanent secretariat to, 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 to manage the crisis in Myanmar, given that this is a long-term problem. But this comes with its own challenges. Uh, most of the dialogue partners mentioned have taken care not to criticize the SAC or act in ways that could pressure them for a variety of reasons. Um, so moving forward, I would just end with these uh, three points. I think first, ASEAN really needs to engage with the NUG and with local CSOs and NGOs. Uh, the Malaysian former foreign minister, Saifuddin, uh, has been very vocal on this, that uh, the current Malaysian government has not, and I, and I think that will be one of the questions to me during the Q&A. Uh, and, and again, while I think it is inevitable that uh, most ASEAN member states, including in Malaysia, who, who have been extremely critical, will still feel that their needs there needs to be some kind of engagement with the Tatma Daw in the long term. Um, that, uh, that there is still, from what I'm hearing in Kuala Lumpur, no analysis that does not see a future where the Tatma Daw is not a stakeholder. But uh, this should only happen once it adheres to its basic commitments to ASEAN or, or at least uh, stops the violence and begins a political reconciliation process. Short of that, ASEAN should not legitimize the SAC or the junta, especially in the middle of a conflict. And lastly, I think that there needs to be a serious discussion on how the humanitarian and political tracks can sort of progress together. Uh, I've exceeded my time by quite a bit, Sam. I do apologize, and I'll be happy to take more on the Q&A. Thanks. Thanks so much, Thomas, um, for the great uh, overview. Um, and now shifting gears um, to um, uh, Ambassador Mukopataya, um, former Indian ambassador to Myanmar. Um, oh, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, uh, Sam, for this opportunity and for the invitation uh, to this uh, seminar organized by the Tokyo University, the uh, Research Center for Sustainable Peace and the Graduate Program for Human Security. Uh, I'd like to very much, first of all, thank uh, uh, the Foreign Minister of the NUG, Zinmarong, for her opening presentation. Uh, I think that clearly sets out some of the goals uh, that, uh, uh, you know, clearly the resistance or the revolution uh, as uh, she called it, uh, uh, is aiming for. And I think part of the challenges 
that we have are really how to get to uh, that point. I'd also like to thank uh, Mr. Mozo U for his very uh, descriptive uh, you know, statement on the current and actual situation in Myanmar and uh, you know, all that followed from that, as well as uh, you know, all the very distinguished panelists that we have, uh, who have spoken today. And there is almost nothing that they have said that I uh, you know, can disagree with. Uh, in fact, I can generally support the sentiment, which has been largely in support of the will of the people and of uh, 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 the, the legitimacy of the, uh, the struggle for freedom, even more than democracy, because in some ways, what we are witnessing today is a kind of continuation and culmination, culmination of the freedom struggle uh, of Myanmar against the British, which was actually to some extent uh, uh, arrested uh, by the Tamado in 1962. Uh, and I say that because there's a big difference between the national movement in India and Myanmar, in that the national movement in India was civilian led, uh, and under particularly Mahatma Gandhi became a mass movement and involved the people of Myanmar in a very large uh, sense. Uh, I think that element of civilization, of the democratization of the freedom struggle that we witnessed in India was generally missing in Myanmar. And that was partly because the Tamado assumed uh, control uh, of uh, effectively being the guardians uh, of uh, Myanmar's destiny and future. Uh, so I think in, in many ways, uh, the Tamado is now uh, an obsolete and defunct uh, phenomenon by itself. And part of the reason for its obduracy, which many uh, speakers have commented on, uh, in you know, even abiding by the five-point uh, consensus uh, you know, drafted in April 2021, has been precisely that uh, it has no political imagination. It has no way to step back from where it is. Uh, and therefore, in many ways, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the resistance has realized that the only way of dealing uh, with the uh, Tamado or the Myanmar uh, military at the moment is to fight. One could have looked for signs of cracks uh, within the Tamado. Uh, for example, uh, a reformist section that assumed power uh, through the USDP uh, in, uh, in 2010 or 11. Uh, but I don't think we are seeing even signs of any kind of split or dissent uh, within the Tamado that could actually lead the way uh, towards, uh, uh, you know, a more negotiated kind of solution. Um, you know, I started off uh, uh, preparing for this uh, based on the questions uh, that uh, Mr. Barron had put to us, and they uh, related to, uh, to, you know, the way forward and to the humanitarian assistance aspects of this. Uh, but I noticed that, of course, India has figured very little in the discussion so far, apart from a mention uh, here and there by the foreign minister and one or two of the other speakers. So I think let me just start off by some uh, remarks about, uh, you know, India's compulsions, uh, which I don't support, uh, but the India's compulsions that might explain to uh, others why India has taken such a position. Uh, but that position, I think, is now also needs to be seriously reviewed. I think one consideration is the kind of civilizational links that India feels it has with Myanmar. The second is the strategic projects, uh, particularly the connectivity projects that India has embarked on as part of its Act East policy. The third and often overlooked is the very large uh, community of in persons of Indian origin, uh, which are probably somewhere between one to two million and whose welfare uh, is a concern to the government of India. Uh, but fourth and fifth are really the more security-related dimensions, which is the presence of, uh, you know, Indian insurgent groups in Myanmar, uh, as well as the China factor. Overall, the feeling that if China does not engage the government of the day in Myanmar, uh, Myanmar will uh, fall more and more closely into the grip of China. And therefore, uh, as a kind of uh, uh, offsetting measure, India needs to engage uh, the 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 whoever is ruling, and in this particular case, uh, whoever is in power, uh, and in this particular case, the, uh, the SAC. Uh, I think this is very flawed, and I think in separate, in, in other articles, I have argued against it. One of them is that India cannot regain influence in Myanmar by being a pay limitation of China. Uh, India has espoused the struggle for freedom uh, of, uh, you know, of, uh, uh, of peoples all over, particularly during the decolonization movement. Uh, India's worth and value lies as a supporter of democracy, as a supporter of freedom, and uh, its example 
as a kind of semi-federal uh, democracy, which can still be of use uh, for, uh, for, for Myanmar. Uh, and e even on the question of the Indian insurgent groups, uh, the, the reality is that Myanmar has hosted Indian insurgent groups and also used them uh, and used them very selectively only to please India when it has really pressed the, you know, pressed the button. Uh, unlike, say, uh, Bangladesh, uh, which uh, expelled uh, in Indian insurgent groups from Bangladesh uh, at, at a certain point of time, and Bhutan, um, Myanmar continues to host them. Uh, and so, you know, at that particular argument hasn't really worked very much in favor. And even in the current situation, the Myanmar army continues to use Indian insurgent groups, sometimes against the pro-democracy uh, resistance. Uh, so I think there are various reasons uh, that uh, these things have changed, but I think the most important reason is that India itself has changed character from a country that generally supported freedom to a very status quo, security-centric, and uh, a country driven by selfish national interests. Uh, and um, I, I think those are some of the reasons why people have detected, rightly, a kind of gradual shift in India's position from one that paid at least reasonably strong lip service uh, to democracy, to one whose actions, in effect, end up supporting, uh, uh, you know, the uh, the SAC, and India has not taken a kind of more pronounced position, in spite of the compunctions that I described, uh, in supporting the NUG or the uh, you know civil disobedience movement or the the resistance forces uh, in in general, even though a great part of the um, uh, of the disturbance uh, or instability is taking place along india's borders in the provinces of sagain uh, chin uh, and to a less extent uh, uh, you know rakhine uh, and a little more inside in magwe <clears throat> uh, you know so uh, overall and india's sort of approach to this has been to somehow try and contain the problem within uh, myanmar uh, by actually tightening um, you know, access uh, to, I mean, uh, 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 tightening, uh, you know, the uh, refuge uh, for those who seek to escape the violence. Uh, the Indian state of Mizoram has been actually quite remarkable in sort of exercising its own degree of federal autonomy in being able, in receiving uh, up to 50,000 uh, refugees. But there are other states that have been, uh, you know, more compelled by the, st the central government's indifference uh, to the plight of the situation in Myanmar uh, to try and actually restrict uh, refugees. It hasn't helped that India has, is not a signatory, signatory to the Convention uh, on Refugees. Uh, and uh, according to its law, tends to uh, describe uh, and define uh, those who have fled persecution uh, and violence and instability in Myanmar as illegal migrants rather than as refugees. So I think these are some of the issues that come. Uh, I'd like to address one single point. You know, I think we generally agree with the goals that have been set up, but in the approaches towards, uh, you know, a resolution, uh, one alternative, one approach has been completely missed out. Uh, the ASEAN uh, includes three countries that are direct neighbors of Myanmar. Uh, Laos, of course, Thailand, the most dominant one and the most prominent one, and Malaysia. And Thailand, of course, in spite of many of the points that were made by uh, former Foreign Minister uh, Pirimoya, uh, still does, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 does uh, include a number of, uh, absorbed a number of refugees in camps uh, in along the border. Uh, but there are three other countries that are actually physical neighbors of Myanmar uh, that are not part of any formal dialogue process. Uh, Bangladesh, which hosts, uh, you know, about 1 million Rohingya refugees. Uh, India, which does not host so many refugees, but can play, a, you know, a, 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 an influential role, both as an example and as a pressure point. Uh, and China, which formally or informally does exercise that influence inside or outside um, the ASEAN. So I think one of the approaches uh, that the ASEAN could adopt while preserving its centrality, and I think that's a very important principle here, because I think the ASEAN centrality has, in fact, cushioned the Myanmar crisis from big power politics uh, so far. So despite its many shortcomings, uh, which I totally agree with, and I don't feel that the uh, 
uh, uh, ASEAN is also designed in its present form to be able to uh, you know, deal with a crisis which tests the principle of consensus. Uh, countries within the ASEAN tend to be a little conservative on, uh, on democracy. And of course, this, you know, the sacrosanct principle of non-interference in internal affairs. Uh, given all that, uh, you know, if ASEAN itself took an initiative to include a number of other countries in a kind of ASEAN plus approach, starting with its neighbors, and that include Bangladesh, India, and China in a more formal approach, uh, and also include, I think, some of the other names that have been mentioned. Country like Japan, despite uh, the disappointment expressed by uh, Mr. Perimoya, who has good relations with both the public as well as uh, the army. Uh, the Republic of Korea was mentioned, uh, and there could be others that could play a role. Uh, in generally a search for an Asian a kind of solution to the crisis. Now, I know that the resistance is very strong to have the US on board because that would be a moral support, a diplomatic support, and perhaps even a material support. But I think what uh, Myanmar and the people of Myanmar need to factor is, is the, the implications for that in terms of drawing uh, some of the other geopolitical rivals, in particular China. I think Russia too has been supporting this and perhaps this is Russia's only uh, Indo-Pacific card that um, maybe it is stretched to exercise right now. Uh, and finally, on the point of humanitarian assistance, I think we should recognize that uh, some of the neighbors have done quite a lot, in particular in Bangladesh, uh, by hosting uh, one million Rohingya refugees now for a better part of six years, uh, you know, without really much international assistance. Uh, and you know, Thailand has done its bit. It, India has done, or at least a part of India has done what it can. Uh, but overall, uh, India has become a much more status quo, uh, status quoist, uh, security centric, uh, and um, uh, you know, uh, less uh, sympathetic country overall. Uh, and in many ways, um, the struggle for freedom and democracy in Myanmar will remain really with the Myanmar people. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ambassador Mugul Pataya. Um, on the new note that perhaps there should be an Asian solution to the crisis, I want to turn the floor over to Ambassador Marcial, who recently wrote uh, an opinion piece that um, the United States should be taking a more active role uh, in, in a possible solution towards the crisis. Um, so over to you, um, Ambassador Marcial. Well, thanks, Sam. And um... Thanks very much to the University of Tokyo for organizing this and bringing together such a really distinguished panel of, of not only distinguished people, but people who actually know Myanmar quite well. Uh, and I'm privileged to, to be part of that. Um, I'd, I'd like if I could to speak a little bit about the US um, role to date, but then um, if you'll allow me make a few broader comments um, that reflect I think the fact that the longer this crisis goes on, um, the less diplomatic I am in my comments about it. Um, and also, um, if you'll forgive me, I, I took so many notes from all of the previous speakers that my nicely organized presentation is now completely illegible. So I'm just going to have to um, speak from the heart a little bit. Um, first, in terms of, of the U.S. approach, I mean, the U.S. approach, uh, reaction to the coup and policy toward Myanmar since the coup really has just been a continuation of U.S. policy toward Myanmar since 1988, at least. And that is to support um, democracy, freedom, uh, certainly within that supporting what seems to be a consensus in favor of federalism, but some system that allows all of the ethnic communities in the country uh, to feel like they belong and that they're treated as first class um, rather than second class citizens. So in broad terms, the, the U.S. policy has been has been very consistent. I would say in terms of reacting specifically to the coup um, and, and trying to find a way forward, I think the U.S. policy has been pointed in the right direction, but has lacked energy and lacked a significant commitment to really do the things that that it needs to do to make a difference. Um, so pointed in the right direction, I think the sympathies of the United States are clearly with the people of Myanmar, which means uh, the, the broad resistance and opposition to the coup, no question. 
uh, the U.S. condemned the coup from from uh, immediately. Um, has imposed a number of sanctions to try to put pressure on the generals. Uh, has reached out and engaged increasingly with the NUG as well as with some of the ethnic uh, organizations, um, and has spoken out very strongly against uh, the junta's um, earlier planned sham elections, which we all knew uh, were not going to solve the problem. So I think in all those ways, the U.S. has been on target in terms of, of its approach. Um, at the same time, I think Washington's made a real effort to try to um, not get crosswise with ASEAN and to show respect for ASEAN and ASEAN's efforts to resolve this, including uh, support, continued support for the five-point consensus. Uh, and that's that's true even this week. Uh, the State Department counselor's most recent comments, at least the most recent ones I've seen, uh, reiterated support for the consensus, while also using language that I thought was a little bit stronger than that, what he's used before about growing concerns about where things are headed in Myanmar. And um, that at the same time, the U.S. Congress has passed uh, the Burma Act, which includes a number of provisions, including the possibility of assistance to the NUG and others. I stress, though, so that's the U.S. Congress it's up to the administration to determine um, how to implement that. So again, to summarize, the U.S. hearts in the right place, the approach is, I think, in the right direction, but um, could use a little bit more energy and more willingness to invest and to commit. And to, to clarify what I mean by that, I'd like to, to make a broader point, and this is where the undiplomatic part of me um, has emerged. Um, I think there has been a tendency, a natural tendency that diplomats, certainly I myself included, share, which is to think that there's a deal somehow to be struck if we can just, you know, um, talk to the right people and get some kind of dialogue going. I, I just don't think there is. I don't think there's a compromise deal to be worked out here. This is a zero sum, I hate to use the term game. This is a zero sum situation. The Myanmar military wants to stay in power. And a lot of people, you all understand it, but a lot of people don't understand. They don't care how many of their people they have to kill to stay in power. They don't care at all. And nor do they really care about much other than staying in power. So appealing to them like you might many other governments, even authoritarian governments, in my experience, doesn't really work. Um, they are not going to be persuaded to be reasonable and accommodating. It's just not going to happen. At the same time, I would certainly defer to the deputy foreign minister of the NUG to speak for the Myanmar people. But my strong sense is this revolution is all about saying we've had it. We want the military out of political power once and for all. So the military is absolutely dead set on staying in power and willing to kill, as we've seen, ruthlessly to do that. And the people, the resistance, um, is insisting that the military is out of power. Maybe, a, you know, maybe I'm just a failed diplomat and I lack imagination. I don't know how you strike a compromise deal out of that. I don't think it's possible. And I think that's the fundamental flaw with the five-point consensus and many other approaches. Um, and, and I don't fault ASEAN for trying. I mean, I think it was a, a reasonable effort. Um, so I think it means that the, and, and there's no hope for Myanmar as long as the military's in power. And you have to look not only at the last two years, but at the last 60 years, they have run this country into the ground for 60 years. And, and exacerbated ethnic divisions and caused conflict. So there's no hope for Myanmar, in my view, if the military continues to hold on to power and re, a significant power and remains unaccountable. There's lots of risks associated with supporting the resistance. It may not work, but there's at least hope. And there are at least a lot of good people who are trying to build a country. So my argument for U.S. policy, but I would say for others who, who care about Myanmar, is it's, it's really time to, to take a side here um, and to support the resistance in 
probably not militarily defeating the, uh, the, the junta, but in weakening it to the point that it seeks an exit. And at that point, there is hope and there's, a, there's room, I think, for diplomacy and dialogue and that sort of thing. But until the generals really feel that they have no other choice, they're not going to give an inch. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, um, Ambassador Marcel. Um, next up, um, as a former foreign minister, uh, Perumia uh, alluded to, um, we'll be talking about um, the Japanese uh, government's approach. And uh, our first panelist um, for this um, portion of the event is uh, Tepe Kasai. So, um, Tepe, if you want to. Uh, actually, sorry. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Tepe. I'm a program officer at Human Rights Watch. Um, my mandate is to uh, monitor the Japanese government's foreign policy towards uh, Southeast Asian countries, including Myanmar. So I cover Myanmar, Cambodia, Vietnam, and so on. Um, I think uh, before we talk about the 21, uh, 2021 uh, military coup, I think we should remember that the Myanmar military's atrocities aren't exactly new. Um, if you look at its history, um, for example, in 2017, uh, August, um, uh, the Myanmar military committed atrocities against the Rohingya Muslim minorities um, uh, for, in Rakhine State, uh, forcing thousands to flee to Bangladesh, uh, where about 90,000 Rohingya are currently living in overcrowded camps. Um, an estimated 60,000 Rohingya remain in Rakhine State where they are subjected to persecution and violence, confined to camps and villages without freedom of movement, and cut off from access to adequate food, health care, education, and livelihoods. Um, unfortunately, the Japanese government's foreign policy at the time uh, before the coup was uh, disappointing, to say the least. Um, for example, it, um, even now, it still refuses to use the term Rohingya um, in an attempt to uh, basically pleased the Myanmar military as well as the civilian government back then. Um, the Japanese government backed a sham, uh, quote, independent, end quote, investigation committee to look into the atrocities against the Rohingya. And the Japanese ambassador to Myanmar, Ichiro Mariyama, who is uh, still the ambassador now, um, repeatedly described the Rohingya as Bengali, which is a discriminatory term, uh, implying that they're not from Myanmar, that they're from Bangladesh. Um, and he also, uh, um, told local media that there was no genocide in Rakhine State, despite um, you know uh, provisional measures still not being handed down by the ICJ. So you have, um, and then also you also have the Japanese government uh, abstaining from uh, virtually all UN resolutions uh, criticizing atrocities against the Rohingya. So you have a very disappointing, um, uh, what I used to call a values-free diplomacy towards Myanmar, even before the coup. Um, and then that changed slightly after the coup. Um, my opinion is that they could no longer ignore the military's atrocities. Now it's spilled over to the majority population instead of the minority Rohingya. And so now um, the Japanese government and the Japanese companies invested in Myanmar can't ignore this issue. Um, so I'm going to go over what the Japanese government has done uh, since the coup. Um, it has issued official statements condemning the coup, um, including a diet resolution unanimously passed in 2021, uh, June. Um, it has suspended new uh, non-humanitarian aid. Um, it has continued to provide humanitarian aid at the same time. Um, and you may have seen this in the news, but it, uh, I think last year it uh, suspended the intake of new military officers and cadets from the Myanmar military for military training uh, by the Japanese defense ministry. So I think so maybe it's not as well known, but yeah, it's, it's very surprising to me still that there are Myanmar military officers and cadets in Japan right now receiving military training at defense ministry facilities. Uh, to this day. Um, and on one occasion, uh, the J Japanese foreign ministry excluded Myanmar from a meeting 
uh, with ASEAN ambassadors in Tokyo. So I think that was something that I consider positive. And in, I believe in 2021, after the coup, uh, Japan voted in favor of a UN resolution criticizing the military coup, um, which it hasn't done in years. So I think that was a positive step. But uh, that being said, I think there are things that the Japanese government uh, hasn't done, but should do and can do. Um, sorry, before that, before I talk about what the Japanese government should do, I think um, we should talk about its policies that are, I would argue, making the J Japan complicit in the military's atrocities. Um, for example, I earlier said that it suspended uh, new non-humanitarian aid, but unfortunately, it's, it continues to operate non-humanitarian aid that was agreed to before the coup. Um, that includes uh, the Bago River Bridge construction project, which um, we found out recently uh, is effectively funding the Myanmar military. So through this Japanese government project, a huge amount of money is flowing into a military-owned corporation. So uh, simply put, the Japanese government is effectively funding the military's atrocities. Um, and again, to repeat my earlier point, uh, the Japanese defense ministry continues to train uh, Myanmar military officers and cadets at defense ministry facilities. Um, previous research by Human Rights Watch, as, as well as another organization called Justice for Myanmar, um, located uh, at least two uh, Myanmar military officers at bases implicated um, to uh, human rights abuses. And that includes the infamous uh, Mosul massacre or the Christmas Eve massacre that took place in uh, December 2021 when I think a few uh, staff of Save the Children uh, were also uh, murdered. Um, local people were tied up, burned alive, uh, tortured, shot. Um, and so we have that. And then we also have the very fact that uh, unlike the EU, uh, UK, Canada, US, um, and so on, uh, the Japanese government has the legal ne necessary legal framework to impose targeted sanctions on the Myanmar military, but it, it still hasn't done that. Um, and so to move on to what we think the Japanese government should do, um, it should suspend non-humanitarian aid, um, including the river, the, the river bridge project, obviously because it's continuing to fund uh, the Myanmar military. Um, it should sanction uh, Myanmar military leaders and military-owned conglomerates. Um, there are, there's two of them that's very famous, MEC and MEHL. Um, in, in an effort to financially isolate the Myanmar military junta and to curb uh, its atrocities. Um, third one is to immediately suspend ongoing military training. So the very fact that there are military officers and cadets in Tokyo at this moment being trained by the Japanese government is still um, unbelievable to me. So that should be immediately suspended. Um, another effort the Japanese government should support is um, international justice efforts at the ICC and the ICJ. Um, this should be done publicly um, and also privately. Um, and this is related to uh, atrocities against Rohingya as well. And then um, at the minimum, uh, proactively accept refugees from Myanmar, including the Rohingya Muslim minority. Um, obviously this, this isn't just about Myanmar, it should be about all refugees, um, but because yeah, we're talking about Myanmar. And so in short, uh, Japan, since the coup, Japan has taken some steps, but it hasn't exhausted all of its diplomatic options uh, to chip away at the Myanmar military's impunity. Um, and so it's, I, I would argue it's being complicit in what the Myanmar military is doing. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you. Well, thank you, Teke. Um, this is Yasuno Sato, uh, former director of the uh, this center, research center for Um My uh, points are three. Um, the first point is uh, uh, human security, uh, which is actually uh, promoted by Japanese government, in fact, in the United Nations um, International Co uh, Corporation, should be also reminded to, to protect and uh, also empower the, these uh, Myanmar people and refugees. Um, together with international communities, especially in Asian uh, friends and co-allied. And 
Um, the second point is uh, uh, business and human rights. Uh, this is also the now it's a kind of fashionable in Japan and the Japanese government also supporting promoting Asia, especially the UNDP the regional office in uh, Bangkok. Uh, the one uh, of the, my colleague, the Japanese lawyer, is uh, actually seconded to, to promote uh, this business human rights and funded by Japanese government. And last uh, summer. Um, the Mr. Nakatani, who is the assistant to uh, Prime Minister Kishida on international human rights, actually the, uh, made a presentation on the business human rights in Asia when in Myanmar and Japan. Oh, this should be also be, uh, should be the highlighted for the Japan's law. So the first one, Japanese history, historical responsibility in Asia, and second is also responsibility of the business human rights in Asia, is that, especially in Japan, is actually is depend on the economic uh, sort of uh, uh, development and activities in Asia as a as our partner. So in this sense, this Myanmar issue is not uh, actually the um, far away, uh, more closer than the Ukraine problem, and, but. This uh, Ukraine crisis in uh, Russia is uh, quite related to, with uh, uh, this uh, Myanmar issues in Asia. And, uh, actually, the same point, and, uh, I believe. Um, and the third point, this is a, a last point, especially the academia and academic network uh, should be promoted in Asia. In fact, the uh, UN uh, Global Compact on uh, Refugees uh, uh, 2018 actually is uh, um, provide for the, this global academic network for refugees. Uh, this should be also uh, should it, uh, promoted in Asia, especially for the uh, Myanmar peoples. Myanmar peoples are now the lost a chance for the education. So that is a really the fatal, uh, not only the peoples themselves, the future of the Myanmar itself. The promising uh, young people are actually working for CDM is disappointed and really you know, join the PDF to fight against and lose his life. So, who will be the next generation of the Myanmar? The military uh, cannot sustain it for long. All of us know this unsustainable. So, how we should do? Um, work for that. Yes, this is a uh, um, progress now at this moment, uh, uh, some, there are some uh, situations, but uh, if we have a promising young, uh, sort of uh, uh, Myanmar uh, peoples uh, surviving, uh, they will have a future. So we have to support in such a way. So education is a key, especially academia. And Japan is also, should take responsibility on these uh, points. Then uh, our first thing, as I said, this uh, sustainable peace is related to also security of uh, Japan, national Japanese security related to this issue. That, that is why the Mr. Nakatani, former defense minister, was appointed the human rights uh, advisor. It is, that uh, explains it. And in fact, uh, now that China is actually taking advantage of this situation in not only Russian case, also in Myanmar case. I was told by the um, uh, uh, NUG uh, people in the method uh, last year and the, uh, two years ago, uh, visited the method and uh, these people just informed me that now the China sell the new um, fighters uh, not to the uh, military. Uh, yeah, military for, I don't know if this is really the true or not, but this kind of information possibly uh, because of the now Russian uh, the weakening the, any military assistance. So the, now the China is a uh, take advantage to this vacuum, to depressing the Russia to just get a, a whole uh, sort of take on the natural resources. In fact, Chaopu, this is a very important strategic point in, uh, in so this is a uh, Indo China. Uh, uh, in, in this sense, uh, um, just uh, uh, last week, I think uh, the, uh, Mr. Um, Derek shot 
or Greg Shaw of the State Department Council uh, just uh, interviewed by the Nikkei newspaper. Uh, he just uh, mentioned IPEF uh, and FOIP uh, international, uh, in the China uh, it, uh, economic framework and the free and open uh, in the uh, Pacific. Uh, this framework uh, should be also uh, uh, used for the, especially Japan, US ally to be in this uh, free, protecting uh, freedom and democracy in the Asia. Otherwise, this Asia is, could be, um, you know, uh, expanded by the sort of authoritarian and violent uh, sort of uh, uh, countries. And uh, so we are very much concerned about this. So this human rights situation in Myanmar is a kind of a, really is a, uh, crucial for all Asian security stabilities. And this also connected to Russia in this sense, global uh, context, especially the now time of the new sort of Cold War or between China, the US, this sort of a context. So Myanmar is the, now the same as Ukraine in Russia, defending democracy in the Asia, the front line. So, but we are, of course, very careful not to be create another mistake of the Vietnam War was proxy war. We are not, of course, um, uh, realized. We have to, no military way, this is education. Education is a power. That means, for instance, the Thai government now the, opened the border for the Nesot, the people uh, going to the Japan and the other uh, free world for the asylum refugees. So uh, maybe the military, uh, some people, uh, of course, just uh, um, surrender or defective. In fact, I was also here in the midst of 10,000 soldiers actually uh, joining a CBM. They want to get out. They are now surrendered to the uh, Korean military, uh, minority militaries. Um, because they don't want to kill, just otherwise he can, they cannot survive. They are just forced uh, so by the uh, military. Uh, so same situation in Russia, I think. The, the person who actually using the guns and the arms uh, actually just forced to do that. So if these people get run away, they get the new world, the military structure should be um, collapsed in the end. So that is a new strategy against uh, uh, military for education should be also strategically used and also business. Japanese companies also now keen on the education to the staff of the uh, Myanmar. For the future, they're coming back. Uh, so in this sense, um, create some fund for the scholarship and so then the final point, the academic network, we already discussed Chiang Mai University and the Chernobyl Chur University to uh, share this sort of a, a network to support online education and also scholarship. Uh, in fact, in, in, even in Japan, we have also many Myanmar population. They, are, uh, they would like to study more in Japan, the future leaders, politics and business and so on. So uh, I, I just appeal that uh, we should also uh, create a, um, such a network and also appeal, especially the G7 summit is a key uh, point to take the initiative for Japan. Now the prime minister is India. We invite the prime minister of the India to Japan. Why not have some kind of a side event in the Tokyo G7 summit? Because this is a very much uh, important global peace and stabilities, not just for the Ukraine Russia. We are in Asia, in the Asian context, we have to also work together. So in this sense, Asian Democratic Front coalition should be created in terms of the education. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Professor Sato. Um, so now um, we've heard um, remarks from very um, wide-ranging um, 
countries. And now we're going to transition to um, session two, um, which is the panel discussion. Um, so first, I'd like to pose um, um, two or three general questions to, to all the panelists. And then I have um, particular questions um, for, for, um, for particular panelists. Um, the first kind of question I'd like to raise um, for everyone is, why do you think that um, the Myanmar crisis has quote unquote uh, been forgotten by the international community? Um, so obviously the situation in Ukraine, some people argue have overshadowed um, kind of a humanitarian catastrophe um, in Myanmar, but um, given um, I guess the urgency to you know find a resolution and end and, and the suffering of you know millions of refugees and, and internal, internally displaced people um, across the country. Um, what can be I guess why is this happening and what can be done to I guess bring attention back to um, the Myanmar issue? Yes, the four minutes. Um, please go ahead. Yeah, let, let me attempt to, 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 to answer. I think that because the international community has placed all the hopes and so on on the collective function of the ASEAN community, it is being perceived that the Myanmar crisis is an ASEAN family problem and ASEAN should be in the position to do so. And ASEAN did achieve great things with Myanmar the past two decades. One, the Nagi cyclone recovery rehabilitation. Second, the realization of the seven point roadmap back to democracy. So it has been a two set of successful story and now we have this coup d'etat and the crisis. So it should be the responsibility of the ASEAN community, which is rightly so. But what the difference between the two previous joint success uh, responsibility of ASEAN was the collective leadership and the consensus and so on. But with the current Myanmar crisis, somehow the collective leadership of ASEAN has not come to the fore. And uh, it doesn't have to be the chair that has to take the leadership. Any one of the member states of ASEAN could have taken the leadership you know, on the, I think, Vietnamese occupation of Cambodia, it was very much the Indonesian foreign minister at that time, Ali Alatas, was very instrumental and so on. When it came to the seven point roadmap, I think we were very active from the Thai foreign ministry point of view and so on. So there is a need or there was a need at that time of a country leadership to take the lead. But so far on this Myanmar crisis, Brunei leadership chair was hopeless. Hun Sen uh, overrated himself and he failed completely. And now is Indonesian chairmanship for three months. Nothing has been forthcoming from the Indonesian president or from the Indonesian foreign minister, which is quite unbecoming of Indonesia. It always has been taking the lead of ASEAN whenever there are problems anywhere inside the ASEAN, Indonesia, was there, but not this time. So I would like to urge the Indonesian authorities to take up the mantle of leadership. And once Indonesia decide to do so, it can bring Thailand definitely along. Thailand would listen very attentively to whatever Indonesia would like to do to help solve the Myanmar crisis. The second problem is the fact that the UN Secretary General has not been as active and he has failed in the appointment of the UN Special Envoy. The United Nations is not here and there, unlike the previous UN Secretary General that have been more proactive. UN Secretary General cannot come up with the excuse that he is too bogged down with the grain transportation from Ukraine or he's too bogged down with the Ukraine Russia. The UN Secretary General must be able to do 10, 15 things at the same time. And I think the Myanmar question is about democracy and the UN Secretary General must be more proactive than this. And I would like to place a bit of a blame on the very personality of the UN Secretary General. Thank you. Thank you, Foreign Minister Premier. Um, 
Does any other panelists want to comment on those remarks or my question? Uh, uh, yes, yes, Ambassador Mukul Padaya, please. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you for giving me the floor again. I uh, agree with um, uh, you know former Foreign Minister Mr. Piromia, but I'd like to add another dimension, and this dimension is really a problem that lies with the West. Uh, in many ways, I think if we see, uh, you know, uh, the United States and the West have been very strong on the defense of sovereignty and the defense of uh, democracy and freedom in Ukraine. But it seems to have lost interest in democracy elsewhere in the world, particularly in the developing world. Uh, we see a complete betrayal of, uh, you know, democracy in Afghanistan. Uh, we see in spite of, uh, you know, I think the kind of, uh, the kind of statements that uh, uh, Ambassador Martial pointed out, in support of Myanmar. We haven't seen very active support for democracy in Myanmar, and for that matter, in many other parts. And if we also see the, uh, the positive actions of the United States, they have tended to fall back, uh, and the West in general, they've tended to fall back on a kind of Anglo-Saxon identity. Uh, so when it comes to security, uh, the priority at one stage shifted to the AUKUS, uh, the Australia-UK-US uh, 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 alliance uh, when it comes to dealing with China, even though the Quad uh, was already there. And also, I think there have been, in spite of, you know, President Biden's commitment to democracy, which I take seriously, uh, there have been challenges to uh, democracy from majoritarian populism within the West. We have seen an insurgency in the United States, but we've also seen, you know, a very rightward shift uh, within the public opinion and political opinion in large parts of the West. Uh, and I think for these various reasons, in many ways, uh, the struggle for democracy and for freedom in countries in Asia and uh, 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 Myanmar is not the only one. There have others. There have been others too that have uh, suffered the same fate. Uh, you know, uh, have tended to be uh, uh, tended to be uh, sidelined. Uh, there is a positive development in the Burma Act. Uh, you know, Western intervention in democracy has been problematic, uh, but the values that support, uh, you know, democracy, freedom, uh, all the values that come with the French Revolution, with the American War of Independence, and uh, with the struggle uh, against colonization and imperialism in Asia, uh, these values uh, remain uh, valid and international. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, Ambassador Marcio, you want to come in? Um, thank you. Just very briefly. Uh, uh, I'm going to resist, uh, uh, my dear friend, Ambassador Gatha. I'm going to resist the temptation to um, respond and 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 have a, a long philosophical debate about that. I just wanted to add one other point that I think is just a practical uh, factor. Um, unlike Ukraine, where you can get journalists can get into the country and film um, quite easily, it's very difficult and quite dangerous for, I mean, it's dangerous in Ukraine, but very difficult for journalists to get in uh, and travel around inside Myanmar. So it's just a practical reason. There's there's a lack of interest, which is the fundamental problem, exacerbated by, I think, a lack of, of media access and attention. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, I guess uh, in the interest of time, um, I'll move on to the next question, um, which uh, relates to, um, you know, uh, humanitarian aid on the ground. So as my understanding is, uh, is the current situation in Japan, the Japanese government doesn't provide um, cross-border uh, humanitarian aid and, and isn't uh, necessarily engaging with um, a lot of um, ethnic relief organizations and civil society organizations on the ground. I can provide relief to a lot of these um, refugees and IDPs being impacted by both a the economic devastation and also um, military clashes continuing between the military um, and these groups. And so I wanted to get um, the perspective of different panelists and especially um, Adelina, if you could um, chime in on the, the role of ASEAN. Um, what should we be doing um, to, I guess, increase uh, access to humanitarian aid um, without, I guess, necessarily engaging the hunter directly, or I mean, do you see a role for doing so? Um, Adelina, if you could, if you could um, address this question first, that'd be great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Sam, for uh, the question. I have actually written um, quite a number of articles uh, that talk about uh, uh, 
uh, why ASEAN and the world uh, should uh, take the uh, al alternative approach, the inconvenient and popular approach, which is actually technically feasible. Uh, uh, as well as political, viable, and mor morally imperative. And I define it as humanitarian resistant, uh, borrowing the term from uh, Professor Hugo Slim, uh, or it's also called uh, resistant humanitarianism, whatever it is. But it's uh, actually a, an approach whereby uh, humanitarian aid uh, should be channeled through the people that are trusted uh, should be channeled through the actors, the human actors that are trusted by the people. So it, uh, I have written, uh, uh, as I mentioned, a number of articles and I actually counted, you know, during the conversation that we had, it was six articles so far and close to 8,000 words. And I could write a book following uh, Ambassador Scott's uh, step. Uh, writing a book about, about this uh, humanitarian resistance uh, in Myanmar. But it has been quite uh, difficult, you know, uh, to uh, promote this approach because as I said, it's unpopular. Um, as we know, the international humanitarian community, including ASEAN, has been government-centric, not people-centric. So within this uh, government-centric, uh, then they will uh, utilize the so-called government channel. And that government channel that they recognize is the junta. Uh, but we all know that uh, it is not uh, the effective way of channeling aid because we also know that uh, uh, the junta will not actually provide the access to uh, anyone and they will actually utilize the information and we weaponize the aid. So, uh, you know, this actually have been uh, uh, widely said, not only in my articles, but also in other people's articles, you know? Um, so so I guess the, um, for, for people to actually step away from uh, being a people, from being a government centric to people centric, it's a difficult thing to do. And unfortunately, we are also seeing the same thing happening not only in Myanmar, but also in Syria, in uh, Ukraine. I spoke together with the, uh, those uh, helping uh, the Syrian uh, people. This was before the earthquake, you know, in the northern part of Syria, and also people in uh, Ukraine who also uh, uh, have been relying uh, on providing aid through the local humanitarian actors. So I think uh, um, the approach itself is unpopular, but as uh, Ambassador Scott said, it's something that uh, needs to be done because uh, we all know, and we have tried it, you know, for two two years. It's not only ASEAN, but you know, everybody in the within the international community. Have you gained access? You know, have you been successful in gaining access? You have not, right? And access has been constrained and constrained. So why don't look for other uh, other approaches? And that is to uh, a channel it through cross border uh, humanitarian uh, local humanitarian actors, and we know. Uh, where they are, you know, of course, they cannot publicly say where they are, they don't appear, you know, with the uh, uniforms, and they don't operate with uh, large white trucks. But they, these are the things that are more effective, if we really want to target the most uh, affected people. If it is only a checklist, okay, we already, uh, you know, uh, uh, drop the boxes at the Yangon airport, that, it, that will be easy to do. And you can just do it through the junta or anyone, you know, uh, based in Yangon. But if you really want to actually focus on the people, then look for these alternative approaches. I'm actually quite curious uh, to learn more from the Ukrainian and the Syrian, you know, on how, how to deal with it. And then also to change the humanitarian paradigm, okay? Uh, Ambassador uh, 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 has mentioned about uh, uh, decolonizing aid. This is also a, a reflection of how it has, has not been successfully decolonized. So, I'll, uh, and last point that I want uh, to, uh, to add, uh, to answer your previous question, why it has become a forgotten crisis. Well, number one, and I'm not going to be diplomatic uh, either. The world has been hiding behind ASEAN's back. That's number one. 
Second, ASEAN is also not exercising leadership. So in terms of humanitarian, I think it is time, you know, for ASEAN to exercise a different way. Pull out a center. I used to lead the AHA center, but I know it's not the right humanitarian agent, nor the UN. You know, the right humanitarian agent are the local humanitarian actors who well uh, positioned to deliver the humanitarian aid uh, to the people. So I'll, I'll stop at that. Yeah. Over to you, um, Mr. Bozal. Uh, thank you. So I would like to add a little bit to what Adelina said about the humanitarian resistance. Uh, because there are many ways that the international community, including the United Nations and some international NGOs can do to help more people who are really in need of urgent assistance. So one of the best ways is to get the aid across the border by working together with local organizations. Uh, because uh, so many people, including the United Nations organizations, uh, provided some excuses uh, for not being able to get aid across the border, but I, I believe that there are so many ways uh, to do that. Uh, so uh, they can, for example, should consult with uh, uh, the National Unity Government, our government, and some other ethnic resistance groups who have their own networks of delivering assistance or public services to their uh, controlled area. So as long as international organizations are working uh, with the military hunter for possible access uh, to the area that they want to reach, then the aid, these aids will be manipulated by the hunter for their political, economic, and financial benefits. Uh, if, uh, for example, even with the gap uh, of the exchange rate between the hunter's approved uh, exchange rate and the market exchange rate, the hunter and their affiliated uh, uh, banks are uh, making a lot of profits even before these eight money are uh, uh, not withdrawn from the banks. So, uh, so, so I think uh, the, 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 we should calculate how much money used uh, for these eight reach to the target audience of benefic beneficiaries, and then we, we, we will be able to realize it. It is time to find some alternative ways, another ways to support our people who are really in need of the assistance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, former Foreign Minister, if you want to please. Uh, just one sentence. I would like to suggest that we all uh, have a joint letter to the Thai government for the Thai government to open the border, to give green light for open humanitarian assistance. You know, there are many informal channels going on through the Mons to the Karen Karenis, the Chans and so on. That's not a problem, you know, and things have been moved across for humanitarian assistance and so on, but it's only with some time a corruption. You know, you have to pay under the table and then maybe the military authorities or the local authorities uh, close one eye, then things could be moved. All of this would not have to happen if the Thai government were to say that we open the border of 2,400 kilometers for humanitarian assistance. And the Thai government will be working with the UN Humanitarian Agency, AHA Center, UNHCR, to help coordinate all the development assistance forthcoming from the Japanese government, South Korea, and Australia. Uh, the members of the EU, the United States, Canada, and so on. What it needs is a decision from the Thai government. And I would like to urge that we all put more pressure on the Thai government to open a sort of a green light for humanitarian assistance to go across. Everything is in place. All the channels are there. Everyone knows where to go, where to send things, and so on, where to procure things. But so far, it has been very, very difficult because of this uh, Thai government being very much in awe of the Tatmadaw and forgetting the plight and the, the, the destitute situation of the Myanmar people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, um, Professor Sato? Yes. Oh. Yeah. yeah, no, sorry. Well, thank you very much. Yes, I agree with uh, uh, Mr. Kasit uh, Piroma. Yeah, uh, former Prime Minister of Taiwan. Uh, um, 
uh, when I visited the method, the, the, um, some uh, uh, NGOs, uh, such uh, uh, medical uh, uh, kind of uh, backpackers medical team is actually the, uh, entering the, this uh, Myanmar areas uh, and uh, these uh, IDPs support uh, this emergency uh, support. And uh, I think uh, Japan Heart also uh, now the, still active in uh, Myanmar. Uh, very limited, but uh, very doing a very good job to the rescue uh, these uh, uh, children and the orphans, uh, so on. So um, they're just always careful not to be uh, high profile, to be you know targeted by the military. Some uh, grassroots sort of uh, activity should be still surviving. So I think uh, uh, that's a good idea for especially the Japanese government to be also encouraged to provide informal uh, kind of a human security fund. Uh, each embassy have uh, some sort of a uh, fund for the more uh, free sort of a use for the human security. Uh, this is also available by the NGOs. Uh, these uh, uh, civilians uh, uh, sectors. Also, private sector should be also approached. I think uh, you need, uh, some some Japanese companies also active uh, um, uh, because of, of the uh, just for the um, helping the employees in the Myanmar. So uh, um, my proposal also create some kind of economic zone, special economic zone in the border area to just to create to the uh, uh, support. Uh, these uh, uh, refugees, asylum seekers, at least or ID, IDPs, then just uh, uh, this kind of uh, humanitarian assistance also give a pressure of the uh, military uh, for, you know, uh, in this sense, um, yeah, the international communities, uh, the, not only Taiwan, the Japan and the US and Australia, these are, uh, these also uh, advanced countries should also work together with uh, uh, ASEAN, if ASEAN in India. Uh, these uh, uh, communities. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Salto. Um, very briefly, I wanted to um, bring in um, Ambassador Mukhopadhyaya. If you could provide um, kind of a, your perspective on kind of what's happening on the Indian border, because I think it's um, there's a lot of focus on the Thai side, but perhaps not um, you know in Chin and Sagaim, and you know I think over the past um, year there's been a lot of violent incidents and refugees trying to cross the border, and so. Um, if you could speak to that, um, it'd be much appreciated. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I think there are basically a couple of points in this respect that I'd like to pick up. One is that there are two states of the northeast of India, Mizoram and Manipur, that have received the majority of the refugees. The largest group is in Mizoram. It's about 50,000, estimated 50,000 refugees. And by and large, the state government and the civil society, the church groups, uh, have on their own voluntarily extended, uh, uh, you know, a refuge uh, to these uh, uh, refugees, uh, if we can call them. And amongst them, they include sort of former police officers, also representatives of the opposition, the NUG, the NLD. And, I can't uh, can I... <laughs> uh, at the same time, you know, the center's help to the state government has been very uh, restrained. Uh, so there has been very little central support for them. A little bit of international aid may have filtered through, uh, but by and large, the center has been reticent, whereas the state government has been helpful. Uh, but uh, there are indications now that a certain amount of uh, you know, fatigue is setting in there, particularly on the uh, burden associated with uh, refugees. Uh, and there's very little burden sharing uh, by the state government. The second state that is affected is the state of Manipur. Uh, Manipur has taken a position, even though the public uh, is by and large sympathetic and supportive, uh, Manipur has taken a position that is much more, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 much more in conformity with the, with the center's position. And in many cases, they have been placed in, in temporary, what they call detention camps, uh, uh, for, for at least for the time being. So I think there's a kind of difference between two states. Uh, but the main point that I would like to emphasize here is that, uh, you know, these are also states that border the Chin uh, region of, uh, of Myanmar. And uh, the ethnic composition 
uh, of uh, Mizoram and Manipur includes a lot of elements that come from a common, what is called the Mizo Chin uh, cookie uh, uh, community. So there's also a kind of ethnic dimension to this. Now, on the question of humanitarian aid, I mean, there are two points that, uh, you know, would be practically 70 to 80 percent of Chin state is now in the hands of uh, various Chin resistance groups. Uh, and uh, there are, as I said, ethnic, uh, uh, you know, affinities on both sides. So one thing to pick up a point that was made by Ms. Kamal uh, on working with local humanitarian workers uh, who are also providing basic services in this area uh, is to allow you know, church groups as well as civil society groups to uh, to to channelize it to such local uh, humanitarian workers uh, and perhaps the local administration. The central government uh, of the SAC will object, uh, but uh, you know we can always use the argument that they have provided so-called uh, humanitarian support to the Indian insurgent groups uh, over the various decades. Uh, so I think this would be just quid pro quo. A second very important point that I think was made by Professor Sato is, you know, apart from what you can do in terms of immediate assistance, there is a lot that countries like India, maybe Thailand as well, can do in terms of educating uh, the youth that have been affected uh, by the conflict, by providing placements in colleges, schools and universities, by even providing uh, scholarships. Uh, in the case of Afghanistan, India had a very strong, uh, um, you know, uh, scholarship program offering about 1,000 uh, sc scholarship positions to uh, Afghan students. And these Afghan students, of course, became political capital for India in the long run. So this is something that can also be, uh, you know, a political uh, investment uh, in the future. So I'd like to pick up this. And while I have the floor, may I just make one point, very important point made by Ms. Kamal also in her initial intervention is on the way forward, I think the ASEAN should be able to move towards directly interacting with the uh, with the NUG and the NUCC and the other bodies representing uh, the, because that's, at least if it pretends to be neutral, if it's dealing with the regime in any way, it could also make an allowance uh, for, uh, you know, the due, for what is in effect the elected government that was unseated from power. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, on that point of um, the way forward, um, I want to pose um, you know, this question to the entire um, group of panelists. But um, so obviously, next month is um, the symbolic anniversary of the Five Point Consensus. Um, people like um, Malaysian Prime Minister Omar Ibrahim have said that we should be carving Myanmar out of ASEAN. Um, due to the non-compliance with the consensus. Others, like Ambassador Marcial, argued that you know, the United States and the other you know, regional powers should be stepping up to the plate to solving the crisis. And so um, I'm curious, um, perspectives of, obviously, um, many points have been mentioned already, but uh, I guess starting with um, you, Ambassador Marcial, um, I guess, where do we go from here? I think there's, you know, I think we all know there's no easy solutions. I don't think the outside world can fix this problem, um, you know, certainly uh, by itself. Uh, when I argued in, in a recent article in, in Nikkei Asia that the U.S. Uh, needs to step up and take the lead, I, I think I also said in there that ASEAN is, is sort of stuck because of the difficulty of getting consensus, Maybe that changed. Maybe the Thai election in May will change things. I don't know. But there still is room for certainly Indonesia and I think with Malaysia and others to do some really useful things. And I think the United States shouldn't be abandoning ASEAN at all, um, but doing more to take the lead, but also working closely and, and supporting uh, Indonesia and others as they as they try to push forward and particularly engaging with NUG. Um, but I, I think, as I said earlier, my my main point is that there's no hope as long as the military's um, in in power, and I think it's important as long as the military maintains substantial power. And if I could, I think there's one other thing that we have to worry about or be concerned about, and that's certainly for the United States is this hasn't been and it shouldn't be a U.S.-China issue. It shouldn't be at all. 
And I don't think it is being driven in Washington. I'm seeing some things out of Beijing that make that wor- make me worry that China's seeing it as why is the U.S. supporting the resistance and it could easily become a U.S.-China issue. And, and to me, any government that emerges out of Myanmar, I would think will want to and need to have good relations with China. It's just, it's a neighbor, it's a giant neighbor. How can you not? And the U.S. shouldn't have any problem with that. So I think it's really important, and hopefully there'll be some conversations between Washington and Beijing to make it clear our support for democracy and against the the SAC is not because we're trying to, quote, grab Myanmar from China's influence. Not at all. Uh, that's um, first. It's unrealistic, and it's really un- unhelpful if it gets cast in that light. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Over to you, Thomas. Sure. Thanks. Uh, well, uh, uh, you brought up one point, Scott, but maybe before that, just to re- respond to Ambassador Gautam, I think uh, I do absolutely echo your point that ASEAN needs to engage with the NUG, but right now there's no official, uh, you know, there's, 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 there's no ASEAN leader that's inherently calling for it. Everyone who's calling for it, uh, you know, those persons in the track two circuit, those in the humanitarians, ex-ambassadors, ex-ministers, right? No serving official, no serving ministers called for that. The only one who did was, uh, while he was in official office, was uh, Saifuddin Abdullah, then former prime minister, a uh, former foreign minister of Malaysia. Now that he's out of the picture, current foreign minister has been absolutely silent uh, on uh, driving upon any kind of statement when it comes to Myanmar. So uh, I, I'm really concerned about who is going to drive this process forward if there's no official voice calling it forward. And then that is the biggest challenge here, really. Um, Scott, if I can just sort of respond to one or two of your points you brought up, Anwar's uh, carve my Myanmar out statement. He's mentioned it twice now uh, in Bangkok first and then in Manila. And of course, his explanation was that so that, you know, uh, ASEAN would not allow Myanmar to distract the regional bloc from its uh, ongoing collaborations in promoting peace and security and facing increasing challenges, etc. cetera. Uh, when he first mentioned it in Bangkok in February, in mid-February, I think it led to a lot of questions and clarifications, uh, you know, on, on what exactly it meant. And, and interestingly, the next day, the next morning, uh, the Malaysian Ministry of Foreign Affairs came up with a press release uh, stating that Malaysia would continue to work, and I quote, closely and constructively with ASEAN member states and the chair in an effort towards a peaceful and sustainable solution in Myanmar. Um, I don't know if I buy Anwar's explanation of, of that's exactly what he means by carve out, nor do I buy our ministry's uh, clarification. I think Anwar is a bit too smart to know, uh, you know, he's, Anwar, Anwar is smart enough to know what carve out implies to the region. My question, however, is how is Anwar and Malaysia going to push this beyond you know, statements made by a prime minister? Now, uh, Anwar makes a lot of statements, sounds very good when he's doing it, uh, but what is the follow-up here? Um, because realistically, uh, Malaysia's efforts, I think, are somewhat limited. Yes, Malaysia has been outspoken. I suspect that Anwar will continue to be outspoken, but remember that Malaysia has very, very little leverage with NAPIDOR. Uh, and there is only so much Malaysia can do if it continues to remain the only ASEAN state that is outspoken. Indonesia and Singapore are now a lot more circumspect in their public statements as opposed to they were a year ago. So there is some discussion among Malaysian, uh, Malaysian at least uh, those of us in Malaysia, you know, if Malaysia is the only country that seems to be taking an outspoken line, then uh, where does that really put us in the region? Is this sort of small grouping of Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, and the Philippines uh, getting even more smaller now. And, and, it's, and, and that, I think, uh, that I think will have some degree of influence in how uh, policymakers here think about how to approach Myanmar and what degree of uh, vocalness to take on the Myanmar issue. Thank you, Thomas. Um, I'll, I'll this question of where, where we go from here. Um, Former Foreign Minister Promia or Adelina, do you have any additional um, thoughts on this point? Hmm. Yes, thank you very much. Where do we go from here? Um, I think uh, as an individual, as an Indonesian and as an ASEANer, um, particularly Indonesians who have been working on the Myanmar issue uh, and who care about uh, you know what's happening in Myanmar, I think uh, as individual, we do have something to do. Um, 
So I personally, um, uh, I think it, it is also not fair that we ask other people to do, you know, what needs to be done without actually doing it. Uh, so uh, at least for me, I will continue to advocate for humanitarian resistance and also show that it is the technically feasible, morally imperative, and politically viable. And I still cannot get it, you know, why uh, the Myanmar people, the local humanitarian actors have to convince the donors. <laughs> is it not the other way around? Is it not our job actually to provide the conducive environment for them to be able to work? Um, so that's one. And I think um, when we talk about Indonesia chairmanship, which is this year, um, and also exercising uh, leadership. And I hope that there are Indonesians here. And I have been uh, uh, speaking to my Indonesian, you know, uh, uh, the Indonesian people, uh, students that I have met with. I think it's time that when we exercise leadership, it's not only exercising leadership within our government, but also other stakeholders in Indonesia. Because we have, we have a say as a democratic country. So as a social leadership within our civil society in Indonesia, within our parliament members, I was uh, in the parliament building a few uh, weeks ago um, uh, and talking to some members of the Indonesian parliament and also those coming from Southeast Asia. Uh, academic institution, think tanks and individuals. And in Indonesia alone, I think we also have a lot of homework, you know, on how we deal with uh, uh, those who actually have fled. Uh, from uh, Bangladesh uh, as well as uh, Myanmar through the boat. So within Indonesia uh, itself, I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done, not necessarily coming only from the government and not necessarily, you know, uh, only coming from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs who actually represent Indonesia in uh, these ASEAN meetings. Um, so that's on, on us as individuals, as Indonesian, as ASEANers and partners uh, uh, of ASEAN. Uh, of course, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, I think there is actually an opportunity to repurpose uh, the five-point consensus through the development of uh, development of implementation plan. And I think we have to be uh, very proactive uh, in doing so by really asking the Indonesian government, can we actually be part of this uh, process? Um, I like the uh, idea of having the ASEAN Plus, so it's not only rally support from within ASEAN, uh, to show that you know uh, that uh, we are united, uh, but not uh, for the sake of showing that we are united, uh, but also uh, uh, to understand what actually it, this situation means for ASEAN. We also rally support from the neighboring countries like uh, uh, China, India, and Bangladesh, because Indonesia and ASEAN cannot work on the Myanmar issue without them. Um, and I guess to also look beyond the current conflict and uh, see how Myanmar will need to be reconstructed. Uh, unfortunately, I also share, you know, what Ambassador Scott uh, said about the situation in, in Myanmar. And I'm going to finally quote, uh, you know, some, uh, someone uh, who shared this uh, through the Twitter, Hadley Bull from the Anarchical Society. It's better to recognize that we are in darkness than to pretend that we can see the light. So I guess we are in darkness, but we are in darkness because of the choice of light <laughs> that we want to exercise. So unless actually it's coming from us, right? Uh, as the facilitating factors, because after all, it is actually up to the Myanmar people uh, and it won't happen un unless, you know, uh, there are changes inside the country. But as the facilitating factors, it is actually up to us to de determine whether we dim the light or we actually put a spotlight and how much we put the more spotlight and light on the uh, on what's happening in Myanmar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adelina. Um, uh, we and with that, um, I'd like to officially close out the event. Um, thank you so much to everyone for staying um, 20 minutes over the initial um, end time. But um, there's many um, fantastic um, discussions held and points raised. Um, and unfortunately, there's many questions that we couldn't get to. Um, but I'd just like to reiterate um, my gratitude and, um, and, and thanks to um, both the panelists and participants of today's event. Um, so thank you very much. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye.